everyone and uh, welcome uh, to the session of the uh, Open Source Summit uh, 2021. As you might have guessed, uh, this is not an in-person session. Unfortunately, the current situation did not allow to travel uh, to Seattle. Uh, nonetheless, I think this is a great event, even virtually, and uh, I really hope you all enjoy this session. So uh, my name is Christian Browner. I work as a software engineer at Canonical, which is the company behind the Ubuntu Linux distribution. And I'm part of the team that is responsible for developing LexD. And LexD is a container manager and virtual machine manager. And consequently, it allows you to run containers and virtual machines. Um, it's different from application container managers, such as Docker, Podman, and RunC. Uh, in that it focuses on running full system containers that can be managed and treated just like virtual machines. And I'm also the main maintainer and developer of Lexi. This is a shared library um, uh, which provides a simple API to start and manage containers. And we also develop and maintain LexiFS, which is a tiny fuse file system providing a virtualized view of various system resources. So we make wholesome user space work around container uh, kernel, uh, container development and we are also in touch with a lot of other uh, developers uh, who do user space and uh, also uh, kernel space development. Um, in addition to that, I mainly spent my time working on the upstream kernel and I do development in nearly all container related areas, uh, but also focus on some aspects of process management and uh, on file systems abs abstractions, which I I really like and every year I tend to give a talk that summarizes uh, various developments in the upstream uh, Linux kernel related to containers um, or things that might have an impact on containers or that are sort of vaguely related to containers because as there is no real uh, in kernel concept of what a container is it's a user space fiction uh, it's it's kind of debatable what actually counts as container related uh, kernel work and what um, doesn't. So this is also a smorgasbord of things that I find interesting and will I think will also have an impact for containers in user space. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the uh, close range syscall. Uh, it sounds very unexciting at a first glance. Um, whoops, it. Uh, uh, it was added in kernel 5.9 and it simply allows to efficiently close the range of file descriptors uh, up to all file descriptors uh, of a calling task. And so in this example uh, on the slide, we would essentially close, uh, we would essentially close all file descriptors starting from zero up to the, uh, up to the last file descriptor that could possibly um, be open. Um, so what are the use cases for this? Well, uh, one of the use cases close range uh, was designed for is to drop file descriptors just before exec. Um, usually this would be expressed in the, the sequence you see up there, um, unshare clone files, uh, close range, and then the, uh, the range of file descriptors that you would want to close. This is one option, would, one, would be one safe option to do this. Um, it's one way of working around the problem that file descriptors are not closed on exec by default, so which is also aggravated by the fact that we can't just switch them over without massively regressing user space. One obvious solution would be to say we just make any file descriptors close exec by default now. Um, for a whole class of programs having an in-kernel method of closing file descriptors, uh, all file descriptors is very helpful. For example, daemons, service managers, programming language standard libraries and container managers and so on. Um, and in this example, the, the clone files example is needed if the calling task is, for example, multi-threaded and shares the file descriptor table with another thread, in which case two threads could race with one another and one thread could be allocating or opening new file descriptors while the other one is trying to close it via close range. So um, since Linux exec semantics is such that only the executing track uh, thread survives, uh, all other threads get killed, they could still sneak in a file descriptor that the uh, executing thread was not supposed to inherit. 
Uh, for the general case, uh, case close range before the exec VE should be sufficient. Um, so especially if you don't want to incur the cost of having those two system calls. So the close range uh, uh, unshare flag encodes this exec pattern that you find in user space with a hand rolled close range implementation quite often um, uh, directly and allows user space to avoid the unnecessary uh, clone files call completely. So if clone re close range unshare is requested, the caller does in, and the caller does in fact currently share their file descriptor table, uh, a new private file descriptor table will be allocated. Then all of the file descriptors that are supposed to be closed in the newly allocated file descriptors uh, table are closed. And then the old table is switched with the new uh, file descriptor table. And so we get an atomic close uh, of all file descriptors before uh, an exec. So this is uh, already quite useful for this scenario. Um, another use case is quite obvious, kill hand rolled close range solutions. Um, a lot of user space programs, especially uh, libraries, um, uh, implement closing all file descriptors by parsing through uh, slash proc slash pit slash fd and then all file descriptors and calling close on each file descriptor. And so back when we looked at all the various largest code, user space code bases, this pattern of having a hand rolled user space version of close range was pretty common. You had service managers such as systemd, you had libc such as uh, glibc, you had various container runtimes, um, you also had programming language runtimes and standard libraries such as python or, or rust and with close range all of these hand so hand rolling such functions is not needed anymore. It's a, a simple system call and uh, it also works when procfs support is not even compiled into the kernel or procfs isn't mounted or the caller doesn't have access to uh, procfs which is also um, a nice benefit you get um, the performance gain is striking too we did uh, or i did performance measurements um, comparing a simple user space close range implementation with the close range syscall so for this close all of these uh, all of these functions as i've called it here is really really very bare bone it doesn't do any complex handling where you need because it's not as easy as it sounds to actually write a uh, um, a function that closes all file descriptors in user space. So I, I did a very simple one that is as cheap as possible. And uh, you can see that the performance gain is, is really massive, especially if you go into closing a lot of, uh, a lot of file descriptors. And since we merged close range, we also um, tweaked it a bit to be a, a little bit faster, but I don't think this, this is any serious bottleneck and really a, uh, a function that needs to be extremely uh, um, performant. Uh, close range is also allowed, uh, uh, designed to allow for some flexibility. Uh, specifically, it does not simply always close all open file descriptors of a task. And instead, callers can specify an upper bound, as you can see here. For example, you could have a first close range this call where you close all file, des file descriptors uh, um, from three to 10 uh, upwards. And uh, then you could leave, for example, a gap where you have allocated file descriptors or reordered file descriptors that you want to keep open. And then you have a, uh, do a separate close range uh, syscall, which closes everything starting from 100 uh, up to infinity, more or less. So, um, this is useful for uh, scenarios where specific file descriptors are created uh, with well-known numbers that are supported, supposed to be excluded from getting close. For example, systemd does this quite regularly where it has a lot of file, where some services allocate a lot of file descriptors and it already orders them. Um, and uh, here is, here we see a, a new addition to the close range syscall, uh, which was merged not too long ago, the close range clo exec flag, which is uh, a use case that we uh, come from the container people where they interact with a second profile that might want to block the close range syscall, which some people might want to do. 
So uh, you have two options essentially. You first install um, the uh, second profile, then call close range, then exec. And the second option is to close range this call first, then install the second profile, and um, then call exec VE. But both uh, options have disadvantages. In the first variant, the second profile cannot block the range, close range this call as well as open the read and close for the fallback on older kernels. And in the second variant, uh, close range can be used only on DFDs that are not going to be needed by the runtime anymore. And it must be potentially called multiple times to account for the different ranges that must be closed. So it's none of the solutions are particularly great. So with close range, close exec, uh, we can solve these issues. The runtime is able to use the existing OpenFDs and the second profile can block close range. Uh, and the close range close uh, flag, what it does is instead of actually closing the file descriptors, it just marks the range as close on exec, which is uh, a, a great addition. One last nice thing about the system call is that we coordinated uh, it with uh, the FreeBSD folks. So FreeBSD has the exact same uh, system call as Linux does, which is excellent. And the system call has since seen quick and wide adoption user space. It's used by a variety of projects that just jumped right onto it, which is obviously uh, great to see. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is um, SECOM. So over the last year, which is obviously an important building block of containers, I'm not going to go into this, allow us to block system calls and so on. Um, and uh, over the last year, SECOM has gained an important new feature, which is called the SECOM notifier, which I'm going to recap real quick, or the SECOM user notifier also, like it's what it's called. And we recently extended this. And uh, I'm going to quickly reacquaint everyone with the second notifier before diving into new features uh, that were added. So um, as we know, unprivileged uh, containers come with a range of restrictions. So any operation that can be used to attack the system is obviously off limits. And two rather obvious examples, including uh, uh, device nodes, so creating device nodes and mounting uh, file uh, file systems. So if a task running in a user namespace were to be able to create character or block device nodes, uh, they could, for example, create slash def slash kmem or any other critical device node and use the device to take over uh, the whole system. So the kernel simply blocks creating all device nodes in user namespaces, even though there are device nodes such as slash uh, def null, def zero and so on that are completely safe. Um, similar if a task were to be able to mount uh, arbitrary block devices, it could mount malicious file system images uh, and also use this to uh, crash the kernel. So other operations are less hazardous, but they are still of limits for good reasons. So for example, attaching arbitrary VPF programs. Uh, but of course, these restrictions are pretty annoying. Um, not being able to mount block devices or to create device nodes means quite a few workloads will not be able to run in unprivileged containers, even though they could be made uh, to run safely. Uh, quite often a container manager like LexD will know better than the kernel when an operation uh, that a container tries to perform is safe. So we somehow would need a way uh, to allow the container to perform syscalls uh, the container manager to perform syscalls for the container. And this is exact, uh, uh, exactly what the second notifier uh, allows us to do. And uh, the, this is the problem that it solves. Uh, in, in its essence, the second notifier mechanism is simply a file descriptor for a specific second filter. And when a container starts, it will usually load a second filter to restrict its attack service. And that is even done from privileged containers most of the time, even though it's not strictly necessary. And with the addition of uh, the second notify mechanism, a container uh, wishing to have a subset of syscalls handled by another process can set the second red user notif flag, as it's called, uh, on uh, its second filter, 
and this flag will instruct the kernel to return a file descriptor to the calling task after having loaded its filter. And this file descriptor is simply what we call the second notify file descriptor or second uh, user notifier or second notifier. There are uh, various ways to refer to this. Uh, what the container can then do is to send this uh, notify FD, second notify FD to the container manager or another suitably privileged process, which will usually, uh, uh, which will usually, yes, as I said, which will usually be more privileged as, uh, as the container. Otherwise, there wouldn't be much point. Um, and since the second notify FD is pollable, it is possible to put it into an event loop such as epoll, poll, or select and don't use select and wait for the file descriptor to become readable and uh, for the kernel to, retall, uh, to return uh, uh, that uh, epoll in to user space. So for the second notify to become readable means that the second filter it refers to has detected that one of the tasks it has been applied to has performed the syscall that is part of the, of the policy it implements. And this is just a very complicated way of saying the kernel is notifying the container manager that the task in the container has performed the syscall it cares about. So for example, make not or mount. Uh, put another way, this means the container manager can listen for syscall events for uh, tasks running in the container. Now, instead of simply running the filter and immediately reporting back to the calling task, the kernel will send a notification to the container manager on the second notify FD and block the task performing the syscall. Well, and what this allows the container manager or any other suitably privileged process to do is to emulate syscall in user space and then report back, uh, tell the kernel to report back to the intercepted and blocked task whether or not it should report success or uh, failure. And this syscall emulation mechanism had quite a few limitations. We, we couldn't intercept all or most of the system calls. We never will be, we will never be able to intercept all system calls like uh, fork or clone. It's very unlikely that this can be made to work. And uh, as things stand, we are unable to intercept system calls uh, such as open that cause new file descriptors to be installed in the task performing the syscall. We also can't operate on file descriptors uh, in lieu of the task because we cannot get file descriptors out of the task unless obviously we share the file descriptor table with the task which is usually never the case for the container manager and would also be super weird if you supervise another task I, but maybe I'm not imaginative enough. So this is the reason why we added a new addFD octal for the second notifier and this new second notification uh, this new second extension allows the container manager to instruct the target task to install a set of file descriptors into its own file descriptor table before instructing it to move on and uh, this way it's possible to intercept system calls such as open or accept and uh, install or replace like dupe 2 for example the container managers resulting in the in the target target task that's a complicated way of saying you can intercept you can open uh, uh, files for another process this new technique opens the door to being able to make massive changes in user space which, space, which is uh, great. So for example, techniques such as enabling uh, unprivileged access to perf event open and BPF for tracing are available for this mechanism. The manager can also inspect the program, the BBF program, for example, or perf event program, and the way the perf events are being set up to prevent the user from doing ill to the system. And on top of that, you have various networking techniques uh, such as uh, zero cost IPv6 transition mechanisms in the future and so on. So this is actually um, a really exciting um, technology. Uh, related to that, and also unrelated to that, uh, we introduced a new system call uh, PIDFD GetFD, uh, which is useful for the second notifier as well. Uh, but is also independently useful of it. In essence, the system call allows to retrieve a file descriptor from another process. 
And to do this, the PID of D or a PID of D of the target task needs to be specified and the file descriptor number that you want to retrieve uh, from the target task. And a PID of D is nothing fancy. It's just a file descriptor referring to a process. It's safe against PID recycling and provides a stable private handle on a process. So if the caller has the right permissions, PIDFD getfd will then return a file descriptor referring to the file referenced by the past in file descriptor number. This is useful in general where abstract Unix sockets, for example, with SEM writes aren't or can't be used. Uh, it's also useful when the target task cannot be expected to cooperate. So uh, syscall supervisors using the second notify employ the system call, for example, to retrieve file descriptors returned by intercept the system call, such as open or accept or BPF. And if you think about it, you can already see if uh, the target task, the supervised tasks uh, opens a file descriptor, opens a file and the file descriptor is returned from open, you can do pidfd getfd to retrieve it, you can perform whatever ever operation you want in the year of the task, and you can even swap out uh, the file descriptor by using the addFD octal um, to, for example, transparently replace the file descriptor for the target task. So uh, pretty cool, PDFD, getFD, and addFD is a really nice complementary uh, mechanisms. Another core uh, comp component of um, of containers are obviously uh, C groups, and they are used to limit resources of containers, just memory, um, CPU, uh, maximum number of processes, and so on. And most of these features are implemented as what we call controllers, as they allow to control and delegate the resource uh, that they refer to. So. Obvious example, the memory controller allows to control the memory available to the container in various forms. And in addition to such uh, proper uh, resource controllers, C groups also have what we call utility controllers. And utility controllers don't delegate a, a proper resource, but instead they implement other useful management uh, functionality. So one obvious example is the freezer utility controller. The freezer utility controller doesn't delegate any resource. Uh, it is simply allows to recursively freeze and unfreeze a given cgroup hierarchy. And it, it is implemented as a simple file, cgroup.freeze, that can be written to in order to freeze or unfreeze the given cgroup hierarchy. So far, uh, the freezer controller was one of the uh, few utility controllers available. And with newer kernels, uh, we added a new utility controller, uh, which is called the kill utility controller. And this controller allows to recursively kill all processes in a given uh, C group hierarchy. Um, similar to Freezer, uh, the utility controller is implemented as a simple file called cgroup.kill. And uh, it's only writable and not readable. Writing one to the cgroup.kill file will cause all processes in uh, the given cgroup hierarchy to receive a sick kill signal, causing their immediate termination. Um, and prior to the implementation of this kill utility controller, user space applications had to recursively walk a cgroup hierarchy down to the leave node and iterating through all live processes, sending each process a signal, uh, uh, signal by hand. This was obviously racy and also costly. So with cgroup.kill, we can guarantee that concurrent forks can't inject new tasks while the cgroup hierarchy is being killed. Um, it's only available in the unified cgroup hierarchy and is available in all cgroups apart from the root cgroup, similar to the freezer utility controller. So user, if you're in user space, uh, you can, and the kernel that support it, it's easy to check. You just need to check for the existence of the cgroup.kill file in a non-ancestor cgroup. Uh, you can get rid of the uh, complex uh, uh, complex code to kill all processes in the cgroup and just simply rely on cgroup.kill. Um, on old kernels, mounting was done by using uh, a single multiplexing syscall 
call it mount. Most uh, people who have programmed uh, on Linux in more low-level environments will have encountered this. This is, uh, this is also the, uh, uh, the, the system call used exclusively by the mount user space tool that probably even more people are familiar with. Um, and it was a single system call which clumsily multiplexed a variety of operations uh, which caused a lot of muddy semantics. So for example, you could create new file system mounts. So creating a new super block actually. Um, exposing a file system for the first time in the file system hierarchy. You could create bind mounts, you, meaning you could create mounts of an already existing file system exposing the same set of files in multiple locations. You could change mount properties for the whole file system. So a super block, a, a mount options that apply to the super block, so the whole file system. And you could also change mount properties for a given mount uh, so something that doesn't apply to all of the mounts, but only a single one. And you could also change mount propagation for a given mount or mount tree. So there's a lot of different things going on in this single system call. Uh, luckily, new kernels have split this into multiple syscalls. Um, together, they form the new mount API. And uh, But one of the limitations was that the new mount API while it did allow changing file system wide properties, so things that affected uh, the super block um, and that applied to the whole file system, it did not allow to change mount properties of existing mounts such as uh, bind mounts. And this is obviously a severe limitation, uh, meaning that bind mounts could not be interacted with in all circumstances through the new mount API. You had to resort back to the single old uh, multiplexing mount uh, system call. And this is, uh, this is also not great because the new mount API has one uh, excellent feature, which is you can essentially uh, only operate based on file descriptors, not on paths which the old mount API doesn't allow you to do at all. Um, so luckily this is now rectified with the addition of the mount set adder system call. Um, the mount set adder system call allows to change mount properties of existing mounts. So it's the last missing piece more or less in the new mount API. Um, and uh, in contrast to the old mount syscall, it allow also allows to change mount properties recursively. That's a great addition, actually, I think. Um, I'm actually praising myself here, which is a bit weird because I wrote it, but the mount properties can be changed for a whole mount tree, which couldn't be done in the old mount, uh, in the old mount API, uh, which also led to quite a few security bugs, which is why I'm, I'm shilling this feature so much. Um, for uh, example, an uh, obvious example is in the old mount API, one could not turn a whole mount tree read only with a single system call. So instead, user space would have to parse the mount information available on PROC and then turn each relevant mount into a read-only mount. Problem, obviously, what, it, what do you do if you had a mount tree consisting of 10 mounts and at the seventh mount you failed to make it read-only, but now you had all other mounts made read-only? Do you turn them read-write back? And what happens if one of the mounts can't be turned from read-write, uh, from read-only back into read-write? So it's all kind of really, uh, messy. It's, it's inherently racy and not transactional at all. Um, with mount set adder, uh, this can be done in a single system call and is guaranteed to be atomic. What do I mean by this? Uh, atomic sounds a bit uh, rich maybe. Um, you turn a whole mount tree read only and if the system call returns, you are guaranteed that all of the mounts uh, are read only. If it fails somewhere in the middle, then none of the changes will have been, uh, will have taken effect. So it will revert back to, uh, the, uh, to the old state and then you can try again. Maybe in the future, we should extend it to also say, ignore all failed mounts, just turn all mounts you can turn to read only mounts or whatever into read-only mounts, but that's uh, that's something uh, for the future. Um, another great feature is that uh, in addition to this, uh, mount set adder uh, allows to clear and set mount properties at the same time. Also something which you couldn't do in the mount uh, old mount API. So this allows a caller to only change exactly the mount properties they want to change 
while not affecting any uh, of the others. Um, the old mount API expected the caller to always specify exactly the mount properties they wanted to set, thereby removing all others they did not explicitly specify. So this, for example, meant that making a mount read only that was no suit and no exec would remove the no suit and no exec property if they were not explicitly specified uh, together with the read only property. With mount uh, set adder, this uh, this doesn't happen, as you can see in the uh, on the slide. Uh, specifying read only in the adder set member of the struct uh, would only make the mount read only, leaving the no suit and no exec settings in effect. Only if the no suit and no exec uh, bits are requested in the adder clear member would they be uh, actually removed while also setting the uh, read only flag. So this is uh, this is a great win, I think. Um, and you can see you can also recursively change mount propagation and uh, what else you can do with the system call we will be looking at in the next slide. So uh, closely associated with this mount set adder system call is the introduction of ID map mounts, which I'm also giving a talk about uh, during this OSS, which you uh, can check out. Um, users can specify the mount adder ID map flag together with a file descriptor referring to a user namespace. And creating an ID map mount makes it possible to change ownership in a temporary and localized way uh, for a set of files exposed under a given mount. So it's a localized change because the ownership changes are only visible uh, via a specific mount by going through a specific mount and all other users and locations where the file system is exposed are unaffected. It's also a temporary change because the ownership changes are tied to the lifetime of the mount. So whenever callers interact with the file system through an ID map mount, the ID mapping of the mount will be applied to user and group IDs associated with file system objects. Uh, this encompasses the user and group IDs associated with, uh, with files or with inodes if we look at it from the VFS perspective and also the security capability as well as the system POSIX ACL access and system POSIX ACL uh, default uh, X adders because they record UID and GID information as well. Uh, so quickly, just to give a, a, a broad uh, glimpse into or a quick glimpse into what ID mappings actually are. An ID mapping is essentially a mapping of a range of user or group IDs into another or the same range of users or group IDs. And ID mappings are written to map, uh, to map files through PROC. It's not that important for our specific example here. Um, at three numbers separated by white space. You can see it here in the example 0, 1003. And the first two numbers specify the starting user or group ID in each of the two username spaces. Um, the third number specifies the range of the ID mapping. So for example, in this uh, right here, uh, UID 0 uh, is mapped to UID 1000, UID 1 is mapped to UID 1001, UID 2 is mapped to UID uh, 1002. Uh, so the range of the map is 3. It's, it's possible to specify up to 340 of such ID mappings for each uh, ID mapping type, so for both group and user IDs. And if any of the user or group IDs are not mapped, all files owned by that unmapped user or group ID will appear as being owned by the overflow user ID or overflow group ID. To most people, this is known as nobody, no group, essentially. Um, in the common case, the user namespace that is passed in with the, uh, in the user NS uh, FD member uh, together with mount etter id map is uh, uh, to create an id map mount will be the user namespace of a container this is one of the use cases that uh, this helps uh, to handle in an elegant way in other scenarios it will be a dedicated user namespace for example associated with a login session of a user as is the case for portable home directories in the systemd uh, in systemd homed implementation and it's obviously also fine to uh, create a dedicated user namespace for the sake of ID mapping amount. So what is this for? 
Well, they can be useful in a variety of uh, scenarios, and I'm just going to name a few. But uh, for example, sharing files or sy file systems uh, between multiple users or uh, multiple machines, especially in, in complex scenarios. So, for example, ID map mounts are used uh, will be used to implement portable home directories in systemd, where they allow users to move their home directory to an external storage device and use it on multiple computers where they are assigned different user IDs and group IDs. So this effectively makes it possible to assign, assign run, random user IDs and group IDs at login time, which is great. Um, sharing files or file systems from the host with unprivileged containers, uh, which allows users to avoid uh, having to change ownership permanently through, uh, through Chone. As often happens that users want to change, change uh, want to share some data with a container, for example. You can also ID map a, a container's root file system, so users again don't need to change ownership permanently through change, especially for large uh, file systems. Using change can be prohibitively expensive. Uh, you can share files or file systems between containers with non-overlapping ID mappings. You just need to attach the ID mapping. Uh, the user namespace of the individual containers to their separate mounts and uh, it can be used to implement discretionary access control checking for file systems lacking concept of ownership this is for example what we did with vfat and uh, you can obviously also efficiently change ownership on a per mount basis so in contrast to chone changing ownership of large sets of files is instantaneous with id map mounts uh, it's especially useful when ownership of entire root file system, as we've seen, of a virtual machine or a container is to be changed. As mentioned above, um, with ID map mounts, there is only a single system call needed and it will be sufficient to change the ownership of all files. Um, it's also possible to take the current ownership into account, which is something that Shown also can do. The ID mappings precisely specify what a user or group ID is supposed to be mapped to, um, which Again, in contrast to the Jones system call, which uh, cannot by itself take the uh, current ownership into account, it simply changes the ownership to the specified user ID and group ID. And it's a locally and temporarily restricted ownership change. ID map mounts make it possible to change ownership locally, restricting the ownership changes to a specific mount and temporarily as the ownership is uh, only applies as long as the mount exists. Uh, again, changing ownership through Chone uh, changes ownership globally and, uh, and permanently. And uh, in case I haven't mentioned this before, uh, it's, uh, it's, also possible, uh, it's also possible to change, the, uh, uh, change a whole mount tree. So uh, the ID mappings of a whole mount tree you can change, you can apply this recursively, uh, which is also a, a really good feature. Um, Going back to the PIDFD API, uh, which uh, saw another extension in the form of non-blocking PIDFDs. Um, PIDFDs, again, are just file descriptors referring to processes, thread group leaders to be precise, but there, this is just a current limitation. There is nothing inherently wrong with in the future also making it possible to refer to individual threads. It will just be a bit more complicated. Um, these PIDFDs can already be used with the wait ID system call to wait on processes referenced by it. So you don't, if you just want to use PIDFDs to do process management, you, you, you can totally get rid of PIDs. Um, but passing a non-blocking PIDFD to wait ID currently has unfortunately no effect. So it means it simply isn't supported. However, there are obviously users which would like to use wait ID on PIDFDs that are own on block and mix it with PDFDs that are blocking and both uh, pass them to wait ID, obviously useful in event loops, for example. So uh, blocking PDFDs will obviously hang when no child process is ready, but non-blocking PDFDs in contrast will return immediately with E again when no child process is ready. And this makes them again very suitable for uh, event loops. Another cool feature that was added is a new capability, the cap checkpoint restore capability. So what's checkpoint restore, what's going on? So the CRIU project uh, is closely associated with the cap, uh, with checkpoint restore feature. Um, and it essentially aims to restore arbitrary processes and process trees in user space. So for example, it can be used to checkpoint a JVM virtual machine after startup. 
and this allows users to resume it, avoiding the high cost of the time it takes to start up the JVM, which is notorious. Um, and in addition to such use cases, it is possible to checkpoint and restore whole containers. It's one of the goals. It's uh, gaining more and more support in various container runtimes. Um, it's mostly interest, interesting for stateful containers, obviously. So far, uh, Creo uh, required extensive uh, privileges in order to checkpoint and restore processes, requiring uh, Capsys admin, uh, which is sort of a super capability, so to speak. And uh, newer kernels rectify this with the introduction of a dedicated new cap checkpoint restore capability, which is great, which only covers the functionality and the privileges required to actually restore a process. And uh, we've made very sure, we hopefully made very sure that this is safe. And this capability can then be set on a Creo binary uh, by the administrator making it possible for unprivileged users to checkpoint and restore their processes like uh, an administrator will obviously probably will probably feel more comfortable setting a restricted capability on a binary rather than a catch-all capability like a uh, capsys admin and uh, last but not least uh, the one of the additions, new additions is uh, support for unprivileged overlay fs uh, this is a patch set uh, we carried in Ubuntu for quite a while already, which uh, is now also upstream, though it's not our patch set, it's upstream, somebody else did, uh, did the work. Um, but the overlay file system is heavily used in application container runtimes, Docker springs to mind, um, and it allows to efficiently share a file system among, uh, among different containers. Obviously not with ID mappings in involved, so unprivileged containers can't easily share um, overlay FS file systems currently. Uh, it works by providing a different writable layers to different containers on top of the same read-only base layer. So you create an overlay FS mount for container one and for container two, they use the same base read-only layer, but we have separate uh, writable layers. And uh, this makes it very suitable to distribute minimal images, for example. And uh, so far, overlay FS mounts could only be created by privileged users, similar to most other file systems. In newer kernels, it's actually possible to mount overlay FS inside of user namespaces and making it possible for unprivileged containers to create their own overlay FS mounts and unblocking a, um, a range of other use cases. Yeah, uh, and uh, obviously in a talk like this, we can only cover a limited number of features there is a lot more uh, things to cover, probably, um, including the new Landlock LSM module, for example, which is a, a great feature. Uh, taken a long time to get it upstream, but it's finally upstream and it, it deserves its own talk. And you should check it out at the Linux Security Summit. Um, the MemFD secret system call, which is a new system call, which allows to create a secret and protected uh, memory allocations, also really great. And uh, we also have extensions to file system monitoring tools such as Fanotify, Fanotify which uh, is now available to unprivileged users as well. So I hope this is uh, a helpful overview covering some of the uh, more interesting features merged over a long time stretch or longer time stretch. And that this talk has made you aware of new features that you might uh, want to consider using in your applications. This is really what it's all about. Sometimes we here of uh, people I have this problem and I don't know how to solve it and then you tell them this has been solved since like 10 kernels back essentially and uh, this is the API you need to use so this is also a good chance to raise awareness of new APIs early and if you want to know more about uh, some of these features please make sure to check out the website and repo of the Linux man pages project they might have already, especially for system calls, uh, man pages added. Well, certainly for all of the system calls that I wrote. And uh, make sure to check out the website because your uh, distribution usually doesn't have the newest version. And also a lot of the things I talk about here will have examples in the man pages uh, that you can use as a first overview how to use those new features, which is also excellent. So uh, with that, I hope you really enjoyed this talk and uh, that you enjoy the rest of uh, the conference, uh, be it in, in person or, uh, or virtual. And uh, for those who are um, attending in person, please enjoy Seattle for me.
and uh, hanging out with other people, uh, which now seems like a, a huge luxury. And uh, for those attending virtually, see you at the uh, next event, uh, hopefully.